Three years ago, Leave New Jersey inaugurated our Women's Leadership Address, an annual occasion to recognize an exemplary, exemplary public figure in New Jersey and hear from her unique perspective, values, character, and lessons that have shaped her career. In the first two years of the address, we've heard from Assistant Secretary of State, the Honorable Anne-Marie Slaughter, and last year we heard from Congresswoman Bonnie Watson Coleman. Bonnie, a member of my own LNJ class of 1991. And tonight, it is indeed a privilege to hear the experience and strength of our third Women's Leadership Speaker, the 50th Governor of New Jersey, the Honorable Christine Todd Whitman. So now I'm about to embarrass Jane Kenney by introducing her, who will introduce the Governor. Jane is managing partner at the Whitman Strategy Group, she served with Governor Whitman both in the state as New Jersey Commissioner of Community Affairs and in the front office, and served again as Region 2 Director in the Federal Environmental Protection Agency. Please welcome Jane Kenny. So I will just briefly tell you about two aspects of the Christy Whitman I know and have known for more than 25 years now. Christy Whitman is a leader. Many of you are probably familiar with um, Jim Collins and his discussion of leadership. He talks about level five leadership. It includes putting people first, supporting people you bring to the table, give credit widely but when results are bad, you take the blame, act calmly and with determination, be humble but fiercely competitive about doing the right thing. Well, I can give you so many examples of Governor Whitman acting in all those ways. But I most often I think about how she would lead her own staff. You know, some politicians kind of let the staff just fight it out publicly like Game of Thrones, American Gladiator kind of thing. Others let them float a trial balloon and then rush in afterwards to take credit or save the day by shutting down a bad or unpopular idea. But Christy Whitman would start the policy process, and I know firsthand as her first policy chief, she would bring people in to collaborate. She would cooperate. She would be interested in not only what the experts had to say, who wrote about the issues, but what the ground truth is, what the people on the ground who were experiencing this every day. Governor Whitman was very intentional about finding qualified women to fill jobs that had never been held by women or by other underrepresented groups. But she was not just a role model for women. She was a role model for everyone who worked with her. Her ethics and integrity, her commitment to doing the right thing always set a tone for the entire administration. I say, ladies and gentlemen, I am honored to present you the 50th governor of the state of New Jersey, the state's first and still only woman governor, Chrissy Tyler. Thank you for being at the top, Jay, for what you do. And that's the important thing, bringing people together from different walks of life and have civil conversations is how we get things done in this country. And I think all of us have to admit, not only here in New Jersey, but obviously across the nation, that we don't see enough of that. We don't see enough of the respect for the fact that someone who may hold a different opinion from you isn't necessarily crazy or bad. It just means they have a different perspective. And the key thing is you show here at the NJ is to listen to the other person. Acknowledge that they may have a legitimate difference and try to figure out where your paths can cross, where you can come together, where you can 
find that common ground. You know, when I was um, first did my hearings up on the Hill, when I did my courtesy meetings up on the Hill with the Senate before my confirmation as head of the NBA, one of the things I was told early on is never say compromise. The minute you say compromise, whoever it is to whom you said it thinks they've lost something. They don't know what, but they're pretty sure they've lost something. How sad is that? Um, to me, it tells me that these people have never studied the history of our nation. If they didn't think that Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton didn't have vastly different ideas as to how to structure our country and how to move it forward, then they don't understand anything. And yet those two men never compromised their principles, but they did reach consensus. They did find an area where they could compromise without sacrificing principle. And that's what's so important. And that's the kind of thing that Lead NJ is trying to inspire, is inspiring in people. So it's really good to see that there's so many who have been so engaged. Right now, I have the privilege on Monday night of uh, spending an hour and a half with Bob Woodward, talk, interviewing him about his book. And as he said, and I agree with him, we are at a pivotal point in our country. This is a very challenging time, and we don't know where it's gonna end up. But we know that some of the things that we see happening in Washington are not who we are or the direction in which we want to go. And, and it's not about one person. It's not just about this administration. It's been something that we've seen evolve over the years, the past decade or so, where politics has started to trouble policy where it has been more important if you get another vote on your re-elect or another person in your focus than it is about solving a problem. And we as the American people need to understand that. And I think in this last election cycle, Penny dropped and people went out and voted and that's a good, however they voted, that is a good sign. Because when I do speaking to kids or to adults, wherever I go, I always end up with the question, well, how did we get here? And my answer may sound flip, but actually it's pretty true. It's look in the mirror. Up until this election cycle, the average voter turnout in primaries was 10%. What does that mean? It means the most partisan of people are making the decision of your choices in the general election. And that means that people get to the general election and they say, I don't like either of these choices of parks on both your houses, I'm not voting. Again, exactly the wrong reaction. And that's why we need engaged citizens who understand that we can have the kind of conversations we need to have with one another and move things forward without devolving into name-calling and nastiness. I don't know about anybody else, but I was kind of appalled by the 17 minutes we were all subjected to yesterday in the Oval Office. This is the Oval Office of the President of the United States of America. And with all due respect to the men here, the one thing I came away with thinking about that is if you put all the women who've been elected in the Senate and the House together in a room, they'd solve the problems. <laughs> Sorry, that's a good question. We do, and that's one of the reasons Jane touched on the fact that we had a very diverse administration. And that was conscious, because one of the wonderful things about this great state is we are I would argue the most diverse in the nation. When you have 150 different languages spoken in Jersey City alone, and that doesn't count dialects, you know we are diverse. And you know that diversity gives us our strength and our texture and makes us who we are. And we need to reflect that in our government. And so we had a diverse government, but it was based on really good people. No, there was no sacrifice as to standard. It was because, but you have to make the extra effort. Almost every time that I was, that there would be a position that was open and I was given a first list of potential candidates, they were overwhelmingly white male. And I'd say to whoever it was, no, 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 go back. Give me a more diverse opportunity of choices. And they would, and they'd come back. Sometimes I'd pick somebody from the first list. It wasn't, didn't mean I wasn't gonna do that. But I wanted more choices. It's amazing what happens when you go out to people and say, yeah, we want you. Yes, you can have a future here. Don't think that because you don't see a lot of people just like you in these positions that there isn't room for you. That we don't need you. Because we need people with different 
with a diversity of backgrounds, with different life experiences, different ways of problem solving. Because today's issues here in New Jersey and in the nation are greater than what any one group knows or can solve. And if we want the solutions that are going to stand the test of time, we have to broaden those who are sitting at the decision-making table. And I'm always delighted when I am with a group such as this of people who are trying to make a difference right now. Because that's our obligation. I was saying earlier, talking a little bit about uh, what's happening in Washington today. I've been part of a group called No Labels since it started, which was about six, seven years ago. And No Labels was just that. It was bringing people together saying, we don't care, Republican, Democrat, Independent. We're going to work on solving problems and we'll work with you and we'll support you. And out of that grew in the Congress a, a group called the Problem Solvers Caucus. And in this Congress, for the next couple of weeks, it's 24 Republicans, 24 Democrats. And they have pledged that when two-thirds of them come to agreement on a position on any issue, they will vote as a block. Well, that becomes significant when neither party has so, such complete control that they can afford to act on their own. And so that is really important. And in this cycle, in this Congress, they came up with a bill on immigration, a bill on border security, and a bill on infrastructure. They couldn't get them to the floor for a vote or a debate because leadership wouldn't allow them. And so this running up and the run up to this fall, the fall elections, both sides, were saying they would they were signing pledges. They would not vote for a new speaker of the House unless he or she agreed to certain changes. Oh, after the election, it was the Democrats. So 19 of our Democrat members met with Nancy Pelosi and have been meeting with her for several weeks. And last week, she agreed to several of these changes. Actually, a host of changes, most of which I can't remember because the rules of the House are so arcane that I would go nuts if I had to be there. There's no way I could figure it out. But the three to me most important, well, the first one is it will take a super majority to pass any bill in the House. You cannot do that with one party alone. You have to include members of the other party. The second is that if 20 members of each party propose an amendment to a bill, it must be debated and voted on. That doesn't happen now. Most bills go to the floor with no allowance for debates. And the third one that really goes to the heart of having a bipartisan approach to issues is that if a member offers a bill, every member has the right to offer a bill in their committee, as long as it's relevant to the committee, and they have a bipartisan co-sponsor, and that also must be debated and voted on. Those things are going to open the process. The problem is that the people who agree to this are in jeopardy. They're in jeopardy because right now our system is operating more as a parliamentary system than it is as a democracy, as a republic. Republican democracy, small or Republican. And that means that every vote is a partisan party line vote. That's not the way it used to be. And so our obligation is to seek out those who are doing what we think we want them to do, who are willing to stand up to their leadership and say, no, I'm, I'm willing to work with somebody on the other side of the aisle in order to solve this problem. We have to be there for them. And we haven't been. We've been assuming that if they're doing the right thing, that's great. But unfortunately, the reality is, and especially after the Citizens United and the growth of, of uh, speakers, leadership packs, and that's the same thing is true here in New Jersey, the leaders have the money, the leaders have the power. And they say to these members, if you don't vote the way I want you to, I'm going to run somebody against you in a primary. Or I'm going to make sure you don't get the support of our group. So. We need to be there for those people. We need to be the counterbalance to that. And I think too often we forget that lesson that we have a responsibility too. We are very quick to demand our rights as citizens of a democracy. We are not nearly so quick as remembering we also have responsibilities as citizens of a democracy. And that doesn't mean just twice a year, voting twice a year. It means being there, being involved. It means doing the kinds of things that Lead NJ is encouraging people to do. It means finding the issues. What are the most important issues? 
when I joked and said that if you put all the women in a room, they'd solve the problems, I wasn't totally joking. I think that happens to be true. Or we get a lot further down the line. I mean, we certainly, the world wouldn't be perfect if we were all run by women, but we would screw it up a whole lot worse than that. Now. So we ought to take advantage of that. But the point being, we want to get people in a room together. Jane mentioned that one of the things that we did and the way we were successful is to bring people together. Again, as Lead NJ continues to expand its membership and its alumni, the important thing is to keep the dialogue going and the recognition that somebody else may have a different opinion, but they may be right on some of these issues. You know, it, it is possible to be wrong. I've been wrong a number of times. And when we see what's happening now, I, I really do believe in what Bob Woodward said. That we are a pivotal point in this nation. We need to stand up and say, we have certain values, we have certain standards, we have things that make us unique. People are coming to this country, however they get here, because they see us as Ronald Reagan said, a shiny city on a hill. They see us as being something different. I'm afraid we're losing that now. And I think it's something that we should value, we should protect, and we should defend. And we should be there for those who are willing to stand up and say the same thing. They may be called mavericks, they may not be straight line party people, but they are people who care about the future of this country. At the end of the day, in a democracy, it's up to us. And while I'm truly honored to be receiving this award, it's really everybody else that deserves it, all those who have stood up and provided the kind of leadership that we see around us and the kind of leadership that Lead NJ is giving a pe people an opportunity to engage and embrace. And so I really want to thank the others and thank Lead NJ <coughs> for this honor. I am humbled by it, but really mine has been just a very small part. And Jane was right. When everybody asked me, what's it like to be a female governor, my response is, hey, you know, I can't make the comparison, I'm sorry. I just was never a male governor. <laughs> but we do need, we need more women. We need a woman governor. It's time. What's wrong with that? We need more minorities. We need, it doesn't mean we don't need white males. We do. We need us all. And this great state, this great state of diversity that is New Jersey, is the one that can lead the nation in so many ways, showing how to get things done, how to work together, how to make a real difference. And I look to Lead NJ to being the leader in that effort. So thank you very, very much. Governor, your clear voice of reason for our nation and our state, your steadfast message of inclusion, hope, and healing for our public purpose, and dedicated leadership to these principles throughout the public service to our state and nation. It is our honor to confer upon you our highest recognition, the Lead New Jersey Lifetime of Achievement Award. Thank you.